So in the last flowchart and video, we left off with this idea that animals are going to have this internal environment. And that internal environment will be very specifically specialized in terms of its compact nature with branches and folds all in there to increase surface area to volume ratio, but also it will be a mainly aqueous environment on the inside. There will be ISF, interstitial fluid, and blood. So what needs to be understood is that a lot of action is going on on the inside of an animal. On the inside of you and I, there's a lot of stuff going on. But in order for this stuff to go on, let's say correctly, you have to make sure that the inside, the internal environment is maintained in response to whatever the external environment pressures may be. So what we're going to be looking at in this next flowchart is the idea of maintaining an internal environment because this is going to be critically important for an animal's success, for an animal to just do its everyday jobs and things that it wants to do. This allows animals to succeed because this is what allows them to not worry about their internal, let's say, structure and function that's going on. So in order for an internal environment to be maintained, you have to look at it um, in terms of two mechanisms. There are two major ways that an internal environment can be modulated. And those two mechanisms rely on either conformers, a broad group of things that are going to do something that we'll see in just a second, versus, and sometimes in sort of concert with, regulators. So we have these two competing mechanisms, antagonistic mechanisms is what we would call them, and they are conformers versus regulators. Conformers are those parts of the internal environment that allow the internal environment to vary. So let's write that down. Allow internal environment, that's all we're talking about here, to vary. That's the key word here, to vary with certain external changes. So there's going to be certain things from the environment, certain external changes that are going to be responded to by the internal environment in terms of variation, aka something happens on the outside and the inside conforms to whatever happens on the outside. This is in contrast to regulators. Regulators will do something a little bit different. These guys, these groups of, let's say, cells or whatever they may be, they use internal, regulators uses internal mechanism to control internal changes. And that's the key word here, control. Regulators are all about control. They do not conform. And so when there are internal changes, there's going to be an internal mechanism to control such changes. This is going to be critically, uh, it's important to understand that this is regardless of the external changes. So that's the big stark contrast that we already see compared to this one, where the external changes do cause a variation in conformers that are going to be a part of maintaining the internal environment, whereas regulators are going to not care about the external changes and make sure that they stay in control. They will not conform. So in essence, regulators are always in control. That's how I like to think of them as. They're very control-minded. They do not conform to external changes. Both of these will play a role in maintaining an internal environment, and you'll see that one actually plays a little bit stronger of a role than the other when you want to maintain something known as homeostasis, and that's our next point of discussion. So maintaining the internal environment is often just viewed as the idea of maintaining something, a very important uh, state of the human body of any organism's body called homeostasis. Homeostasis translates to the maintenance of steady state. That's what we would call homeostasis, very broadly speaking. And when you have homeostasis being maintained, essentially here, you're making sure that the internal condition, the internal environment, therefore, is balanced. So let's write that down. Internal condition is balanced. That's the big idea between about homeostasis, the idea of balance. And this is going to be via, a, via several different mechanisms. So homeostasis is a certain, let's say, state that the internal environment, the internal condition possesses. But it cannot possess this haphazardly. It cannot just happen. It has to be via a specific sort of route. And those routes would be things like temperature changes. 
So if the temperature changes in such a way that requires a homeostatic, let's say, change or shift, that will be an, a way to maintain a steady state. Also, something like blood glucose. After you eat something, your blood glucose levels will rise, and thus you will have to have an internal condition that responds to this rising of blood glucose. Also, things like solute level. Sometimes you are thirsty, sometimes you are not. These are all things that are maintained by a homeostatic mechanism. The internal condition allows for temperature changes or blood glucose changes or solute level changes in response to certain external changes. Okay? So when we have this, we are essentially stating that because these changes happen on the outside, the inside, the internal environment says, hey, something weird has just happened. Something has just changed. I want to go back to normal. I want to be in control and go back to normal. What am I going to do? I'm going to try to get back to something called the normal range. This is that classic idea of your temperature being at 98.7, 98.6, whatever it is, degrees for the most part. Let's say you're working out. You will have an increased body temperature. Why do you have an increased body temperature? Well, your body understands that you need more oxygen, and thus you are giving off more heat. So your body will try to make sure that as it's doing this, it'll make sure that it stays within a certain normal range that is okay. I think of homeostasis as simply a set point. This is a set point that the body understands and recognizes and tries to maintain so long as it has the capabilities via these different changes that can happen on the inside. People think of homeostasis as this boring sort of staying normal all the time. No, it's not like that. Homeostasis involves change, but that change is regulated in a way, regulated right there, is regulated in a way that the homeostasis is still somehow maintained at a steady state, okay? Now, I think that's, it can be a little confusing at first to think of it like that. So the best way to understand homeostasis is to look at a very simple homeostatic mechanism that's going to be in charge of everything that the endocrine system basically utilizes. A homeostatic mechanism would work in the following way. First and foremost, it absolutely needs a stimulus, much like anything in biology. You need a stimulus, and that stimulus is going to be a fluctuation a change specifically of a variable. So something is going to vary. Let's say temperature. Temperature has risen. That is our stimulus. That is our fluctuation of the temperature variable. What is the homeostatic response to this? The homeostatic response would be, uh, first of all, we would actually need to detect that change. I jumped ahead. This, there's going to be a sensor, something that senses, that specifically detects. What does it detect? It has to detect that stimulus. So something within the body detects that the set point of temperature has risen. It has fluctuated. And thus, what's going to happen is an animal response. The animal, therefore, will have the internal environment, maybe even the external condition, will respond. Animal response. And then the system will usually go back to the set point. System goes back to set point. Think of it like this. You're in a room and it's very chilly, right? You have, de first of all, the chilliness is the stimulus. It's a cold temperature. You have detected that there's a cold temperature in this room based off of the different detection mechanisms that's on both external and internal to you. What are you going to respond with? You're going to respond by putting on a coat, by putting on a jacket of some sort, and thus your body temperature will get back to a set point. Notice how you had a variation. You had a detection of that variation. You responded to it, and now you have maintained a homeostatic steady state. That's a simple homeostatic mechanism, and this is all going to be governed by something known as feedback control. So feedback control is another sort of way that we maintain the internal environment in the sense that you're going to have things like negative feedback that's going to be utilized for a homeostatic mechanism to work, whereas you will also have positive feedback, and positive feedback will do down here. Both of these are feedback control mechanisms that we'll uh, exemplify in just a second. So positive feedback. So these are negative feedback loops and positive feedback loops. These are usually going to be sort of versus each other. The negative feedback loop is the following. What you have here, this is the most common, what you have here is a response and the response is specifically going to be, because remember, every single animal responds to a homeostatic stimulus, or a stimulus, I should say. The response will always be to reduce stimulus. 
So the response is equal to reduces stimulus. So that is our home homeostatic response. Now what happens after that? We're trying to restore the previous steady state. So we'll write this down as restore previous steady state. How are we restoring it? We're trying to reduce something. We're going negative feedback. So then what we're going to have is, of course, going back to the normal range, back to set point. Set point and normal range are usually interchangeable. A classic example of this is sweating. When you are working out, you sweat. Sweat is a classic negative feedback mechanism because what happens is the stimulus is it's getting, you're getting, the body temperature is raising very fast and very high. So what is the body going to respond with? It's going to respond with sweat. And if you remember, sweat has water mainly in it. Water has a very high heat of vaporization. It can absorb a lot of energy and absorb a lot of heat. And if you're absorbing a lot of heat and evaporating sweat, what are you doing? You are reducing the stimulus of increased body temperature. You are getting back or trying to get back to a normal body temperature and back to a normal set point. So sweat is a good example of negative feedback. Positive feedback is a lot less common, but still possible. This is going to involve another response, but a different response. And this response is going to be amplifying the stimulus. This amplifies the stimulus. This says, hey, we feel a stimulus. Let's keep on going. Let's not try to go back to some sort of normal point. Let's keep on amplifying that stimulus. You might be wondering when would this be useful. This is actually quite useful during birth. When you have the first contraction during birth, there's going to be sort of a positive feedback loop that says have another contraction and another stronger contraction. Continue this response of contractions more and more and more, amplifying the contractions so that you have a successful birth. This is a very important part of birth, and that is usually regulated by the hormone uh, oxytocin. So that gives us our negative feedback, our positive feedback. This is how we maintain the internal environment. Um, and now uh, there's also a figure I want you to look at. This would be, uh, this is shown in figure 40.8. Take a look at that for positive feedback. That's 40.8. And um, this is going to now give us a nice segue into our look at hormones.